<laughs> okay, um, welcome to the live patching micro conference. Um, we have a lot of talks today, hopefully, a lot of discussion. So um, feel free if you need to talk, raise your hand, we'll throw one of these cubes and when you're talking to the cube, please hold it up because they're having a, they're having problems projecting it. So you gotta hold it right up to your mouth when you're talking to it, and don't put don't put the cubes together. So I think that's, I think that's it. So stand up. Oh yeah, and when you want to when you want to ask a question, stand up while you're talking to in the cube. All right. Also, everyone know that they get help. Yes. So we have an Etherpad. Here is the link. And um, feel free to help out. Um, it's a collaborative effort. Take your notes. And here's Miroslav. So, hi, welcome. I'm Miroslav from SUSE. I'm going to talk a bit about what happened in our life patching tree over the last year. It, it, it was a short year, so nothing much happened. But at the same time, it was important because we managed to merge atomic, atomic, rep, atomic replace. Um, which means that now we could uh, implement what we call cumulative patches, uh, so that if you live patch something in, in a system, a function, two functions, it, it doesn't matter, and then you have a new version. So you, you, you could stack the patches like, like that, and so somewhere in the future, you, you're gonna have dense, yeah, dense patches. Yeah each patch patching something else uh, in, in a system, which is not nice. But if you, you can have cumulative patch, so it's just that each version is a, is a superset of, of a pre previous patch. And with atomic replace, all of those previous patches could be, could be atomically re removed right now. And so this is quite important. This is how we implement and deploy live patches at SUSE. Uh, we for quite 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 a time because we have this feature in KGraph and it, it works quite well. Uh, this atomic replace was in, or could have been implemented thanks to consistency model. So this is one thing which is maybe not so clear, but we have consistency model so that there could be more more feature rich life pages implemented, but there's also the other side of the consistency model. So it, it gives us information uh, about if a code from previous life which is, is even used in a system because consistency model would move all the tasks from, from the old code. So now if you know that there's nothing, there's no task in the old code, you can remove it. So that's why the atomic replace was, was implemented. And the second, Second major feature was self-tests. So now, yes, question. Thank you. Sorry. So on the first one, uh, the cumulative patch and the atomic replace, um, how do you know uh, which patches are to be uh, removed from the running kernel and the new cumulative patch is to be applied? Is it still a series of patches, the new cumulative one, or is it just one patch? It's just one module with yeah. all, of, all the new functions. So you, right. you, you apply it, and then yeah. you remove all the previous patches. You, you it, have to remove it, it all. You can't, yeah, you can't uh, remove a subset of the currently applied ones, right? Uh, no. Right. OK, cool. Thanks. Uh, but of course, it could be done with, with, with a new life patch. So it's, it's only up to you. It would not be a cumulative patch, but it, you, you can still use atom atomic replace, and so just yeah. some functions or some patched functions would be reverted in a way. So that's still possible. Yeah. Thanks. So self-tests. Uh, so now we have self-tests in living in tools, testing self-tests uh, slash, slash life patch. Those are really important. Uh, it was quite a bit of work, thanks to Joe uh, Lawrence from, from Red Hat, and it helped us tremendously. And because it caught a couple of bugs uh, with new features. Uh, personally, it helped me quite a bit when I tried to implement a reliable stack traces support on System Z, uh, which is now in, in the wild. 
So that, that, that was great. So now I'm, I'm thinking about that maybe it would be great to not force the policy, but maybe it would be great to do something we do with documentation. So when there's a new feature, we, we like a new documentation as well because it helps people. And so maybe we should also uh, require new self-tests for that feature, I think, because it is really important. And so, so maybe, I, I don't know what you think about it. I think it would be a good policy, not, not something which should be rigid, but should be, like, what's, what's the correct word? Encouraged. Like, <laughs> encouraged. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so forced. No. Okay, so that these two features were, were really important because now I think that not that the life patching is feature complete, but it it's almost there for almost everyone to use it in, in a productive way. Uh, of course, there are some catches, but now last year I talked about. GCC optimizations and how, how they are not, not so great for us because they complicate things sometimes. So now we have F life patching option for GCC and it disables certain set of, of dangerous optimizations. And we use it in, in, in upstream kernel right now. So whenever you, you enable config life patch, you also enable this option so the whole kernel gets compiled with our certain optimizations. Now you may wonder if there's some performance impact. There was even, there was even an article on, on Foronix about that, so it's really important. And, and <laughs> the answer is, the outcome is that there's almost no Im performance impact. All those optimizations which are disabled were either not used at all or used in, in really small, on a really small amount of functions or a small set of code. So the performance impact was not so important. There was something like 10% decrease in, in scheduler, but that was something uh, we could live with, so I, I think. And of course, there were many, many bug fixes and, and minor improvements. Question. Uh, can you mention the versions of the compiler and the kernel that introduced these okay. features? Yeah, good question. So F live patching made it to GCC 9. So it's there. And the config option enabling F live patching was merged in 5.2. Probably. I don't Probably. Yeah. I don't remember. 5.2. Because now we are 5.3. So 5.2 or 5.1. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. One, one important thing didn't make it to, to the list. So now our mailing list is archived on lore.kernel.org. Uh, there are all emails since starting June this year. We should, we should provide inbox with all the archives, so somewhere in the future it's gonna be fine for everybody. So there's an archive right now. And that's it. Now, there are some things, well, it's over there. Uh, which are not solved yet. Uh, we talked about them last year, and the important, uh, the important outcome of the last LPC was that all those, all those things made some progress. So now, today, there's gonna be talk about creation tooling from, from Nikolai. Uh, it's, it's working, so now we have something like automation tool for creating live patches from from the source code uh, to get the source code. Uh, there's gonna be talk about system state changes management. We talked about it a lot last year, so now it's almost done. Uh, we will not talk about architecture support today. Uh, there's been some progress, so there's OBJ tool for ARM64 flying around. There are rumors about OBJ tool for, for S390 with org unwinder, so that's important. There's gonna be talk about OBJ tool for PowerPC. Uh, so now a lot, a lot is coming in the near future. We will not talk about user space love patching today. There's been some progress. And so may, maybe next year at LPC, there's gonna be talk about it too. So that's it.
questions? Okay, no, so thank you and let's do the next talk. And it's me again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, rethinking like kernel module patching. So now we we have a feature which we like and don't like much at, at, at the same time. So because imagine that you like to patch a function in a module. Now the problem is of course that you don't know if that module is or is not loaded when you when you when you patch it. <coughs> so if it is not that module have to ha has to be patched uh, on load and before it is being it is being executed. Uh, we have a solution in the kernel, and so we don't use module dependencies, uh, which could be perceived as as a go to go to solution. Uh, I'll talk about it uh, a little bit hate, uh, <laughs> later. Uh, we solve it by something quite similar to, to module notifiers. So we have hooks in kernel module loader. So whenever a module is loaded, we check if there's a, if there's a patch for, for that module in, in the system. And if it is not, that module is, is patched. Now, the problem is that it leads to some ugly code. Let's, let's talk about it like that. Uh, because there are some arch specific things in, in the kernel. So, Relocations, alternatives, parent, parent instructions, static keys, and this is only x86. There are some other things on, on different on, on the other architectures. And for example, all the things are currently uh, resolved du during in, in the kernel module. But if you don't, if you patch a module which is not loaded yet, and so you do it later, you need to solve all these issues later, later as well. So what we do is that we take all those elf, elf sections, which are important, uh, rename them so the kernel module does not see them, and we process them later. So all the relocations, which are important, are, are resolved later. And because alternatives and power instructions and all those things have to be applied after the relocations are, are resolved. We <coughs> do the same even for them. Now, it works, but uh, it's fragile. And of course, it's unmaintainable in the long term because you never know there could be a new arch specific feature later and we would need to solve it again and again and again. And now there's no like in kernel notifier live in, in, in the source code, which would tell you that there's a new feature which is interesting for you. So it doesn't work like this. So alternative solutions. We, we could introduce module dependencies. So now it would be just as, as on every patching module would be, every live patch would be like ordinary module. So it would load all of those modules which are supposed to be patched, which would mean that you would load even those modules you, you don't really need. I don't know, <coughs> USB, when you don't need USB at all, uh, anything, file systems, I, I don't know what. So maybe this is not the best solution because I, I really don't like it. It's just, it's pointless to do. There might be even issues with that because there are customers who don't like or who would not like this behavior at all. Uh, there was an idea to half load them so that those, sys, those modules would be loaded, but only initialized, patched, and they would be hidden from the system in, in effect. So that's, that was one idea. Then the other one was that we could split, now there's one monolithic live patch. So we could split the, the live patch to per object live patches. So that there would be a live patch for VM Linux and then for each and every to be patch module. Yes, that could work, but it will, it will also introduce some maybe 
problems in, in our atomic replacement infrastructure. Uh, maybe not, not unsolvable, but uh, well, there, there should be a code before that. So no one knows. We could introduce something like, like per object consistency, but there are problems with it too, I think. So it's not the best solution either. So there are also disadvantages. And then there was something like blue sky idea from, from Joe. So we could live patch only loaded modules. And if a module is not loaded, we could replace, for example, we could replace that file with a kernel module on, just on disk and blacklist some vulnerable versions. So, but, well, that would introduce a maintenance burden and even implementation burden on users in a way that now you don't, in my opinion, now you don't know what to life patch. So you don't know which version of a module is even loaded. So I, I don't know. So those are three alternatives, three different solutions to, to the problem. Uh, <coughs> now to start a discussion, because I think, I don't like any of these, to be honest. I don't like the current solution as well. But I think it's maybe the best one of those introduced. So, I'm always pointing to there, but just it's there, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. It knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, so, my proposal would be to, to just, okay. Uh, my proposal would be to do something different. So, let's, let's go back to the current solution and let's, let's make it better. So for example, we could, I think the, now that we have self-tests, we could and we should implement self-tests for all those problematic issues and life patches. So let's, if, if, there, if we have issues with jump tables, so let's introduce self-tests for all those crazy things which could happen with, with the jump tables. Uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, but it could help us in, in the long term as well for, for different kind of reasons. And we could even, I said that there's no notifier about new features in the kernel, large specific features, but we, we, we could have it. I mean, I mean, we could have a tool which would have a whitelist of known things, like, so we know how to deal with relocations, we know how to deal with alternatives, alternatives and power instructions right now. And there could be a tool which would say that, okay, so there's a life patch and there's a thing I don't know about. So it's probably a new feature. You should take a look at this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's also the case where an existing um, section, like the, the format of it changes, right? So let's say you add a field to the alternative struct, then yes. the tooling may or may not notice yes. that, right? Yeah, so and maybe, yeah, okay, so the tool should be broader, like checking that. I mean, something similar to x86 instruction decoder, because there are two, three, two implementations in the kernel right now, thanks to only two, yeah. uh, and there's, there's a synchronizing code, so there's a script which does just, just calls diff on those two versions, and if there's a difference, it, it synchronizes it. So, just so maybe something like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just have a question about the blue sky idea. How would that actually work together with uh, module signing if you are patching the on disk version of the of the binary? Oh, yeah, so th that's a good point. I think the idea was to patch it at build time. You take the original module, attach some like live patch, um, well, this is one of the ideas, attach some kind of live patch blob to it so it becomes like a self um, signing or self patching module, so and then it, you it sign that. So it will heal itself on loading. Um, another kind of variation on this idea of, of keeping what we have today but improving it. Um, we could, for example, this is something that Nikolai mentioned to me today, we could, for example, just disallow 
um, like jump labels um, in patched code, or and we could have tooling that would that would force that. And and then as an alternative to that, you could just check. You could do a non-static jump conditional, so you could check whether the um, enabled bit is set at runtime rather than patching those the knob or the jump. Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Go, yeah. go ahead. I, I wonder if there is, uh, yeah, I wonder if there is a possibility to actually detect these new features, for example, if it, if they all make some section in the L format. So we may, maybe we could check all built modules and their L sections and check if we are able to handle all of them. So if there is a new feature, then there might appear in the build of the entire kernel new section that we are not able to deal with. Yes, and this, this was an yeah, assumption, yeah. something like this. Yeah. So, Steve. Steve. so anyway, uh, what's the problem with jump tables? For the jump, uh, jump um, you said, wait, the, the so basically static calls? You yeah. No, no, it's not static calls, static keys. The static key, yeah, the static, I mean, the static key, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, have, we haven't implemented static calls yet. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. In the future. No, static <laughs> keys. Um, why is that a problem? The reason why I'm saying that is because you can have more than one jump table or label, like you could duplicate them. And when you, if with the same key, and once you, if you use the same key for, like say if you have a, fun, you have a function, you add a new function. And it will update yeah. both of them. Yeah, I, but, I think the problem was that if you, if you reference existing static key in a different module, I mean r references in the live patch. So that is an elf section with, with that location. So the, the so basically, it's adding a new, it's adding a new self key. But then again, like you said, why? No, well, I, or no, I, mean, no I, I, I don't think so. So oh, when, no, whenever that that patch module is loaded, so you uh, jump label infrastructure nee, needs to know about this location and switch to code accordingly or not. No, well. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so there's something like that. Okay. So if if you look at module finalized in Arch x86, so there's a call to jump label apply something yeah so so whenever a module is uh, module is loaded it that function is called and those locations are processed and acted upon accordingly so i think this is the problem what, wait why is that a problem yeah, because when you when you load a patching module uh that to be patch module uh, well you have to can, find the state I, maybe i guess you have to find make sure it's at the same state as the old one or is it just you don't know what the state will be is that yes, exactly so you 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 don't know because that, that module isn't loaded at all, so it's going to be loaded maybe in the future, and then you need to, to process it at that moment, later in the future, not right now. Wait, you're talking about for loading of a module, it's uh, with a jump label. I thought that the, the jump label would actually be there already. I'm, I guess I'm missing the, uh, the actual problem on space. Yeah, yeah, because there are two modules in, in yeah. play, so. Yeah, it's like the, the old the one module that, that you patched it, so um, when you apply the patch module, whatever, the Okay, it's, so if, you still have the old and the new, right? Let's say you're patching KVM, the KVM module. Yeah. Um, but first, you load the live patch module, and the K, KVM module isn't loaded yet. Okay. And there's a function in the KVM module that uses a static key, and the static key lives in KVM. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the new version of the function of that in the live patch module is not going to be able to be fully initialized if it still has that same uh, static key because the static key doesn't exist yet. Right. So it's so going to try to initialize it and try to... Um, How do you handle global, or, or not global variables, but variables pulled into um, a module? Like well, it's not, we don't, it's not pulled in. We make an external reference to it. So we go find it wherever it is. Um, so when that jump label init, it's going to try to access that key mm -hmm. in KVM, but it's not there yet. So what our current architecture is to delay that jump yeah. label initialization until KVM is loaded, and then we do the, the initialization, uh, initialization specific to that KVM module. Okay. And why is that, or you don't just don't like doing that, or is it yeah, we complex? Yeah, we don't like doing it, it's, it's complex. Um, okay. We have to have a lot of arch specific code, it's, it's fragile. Okay, that, that, okay. Yeah. No, I think you just answered my question, thank you. So, um, as I understand, um, gem labels are not supported if, uh, as of now it's not supported if the module is not yet loaded. 
If, no, if it sounds like you, are, you do kind of support it now, but you don't plan on to. Yeah. Because we are seeing an, ah. Sorry, as of now, we don't support jump labels at all. I was speaking hypothetically because oh. to yeah. simplify the discussion, in other cases, we do that. Like for alternatives and pervert patching, we do what I described to you. We were, and we would potentially do that for jump labels too. We just haven't implemented it yet because we're like, we're kind of tired of doing this, these hacks and so. Yeah, and so, of course, uh, ju just a remark. Uh, it could be worked around in, in live patch because you can do all kinds of, of things in live patch. You can patch like the patching module as well. You can patch the patching infrastructure living in the kernel so you can do all kinds of things. So even the jump label things could be somehow worked around, but yeah. that's just a but but if the module is already loaded, like where the static key leaves, if it's already loaded, it should be able to patch it, right? Because, yeah. but when we create a live patch, uh, we are seeing an RMSA saying that gem labels are not supported yet, use static key faults instead. Is that a different? Yeah. Is that k patch build? Yeah. Mr. When you, is that a k patch, k patch build error message that you're seeing? Yeah. yeah. Oh. So I can't answer that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we recently added that error message okay. um, because we don't support jump labels yet. So, you know, so well, trace points are trace points are different. We do support trace points. We those are I know those are jump labels, <laughs> but they're different because in that case you want to create a new static key associated with that trace point in the in the patch module. You don't want it to be the same one. So like. I guess you could, but the way we implement it is you can enable trace point in the original version of the function or the patched version of the function. Okay, so, so we just don't do it. We, we follow the other way. So we, we reference the original static key. But there's all those trace point macros could be changed a bit. Im no, not improved, but changed a bit to reference the static key living elsewhere. And we just acquire that elsewhere, the address in, in a different way. So it just call seems. So that can be done. And then we'll have a set of calls in that case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be another complication. <laughs> I don't know who came, who came up with that idea anyway. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, any more question or idea? Ideas would be welcome. Okay, so nothing. So what? So now, now we should conclude it somehow. So <laughs> what? So what's the conclusion? So are, are we gonna think about a different solution, or so should we go with the current one and improve it in, in a way I, I was talking about? Yes, Masami. Yeah, I think that there, uh, it seems that the current s solution is a yeah, better way to uh, to solve that this uh, issue because that we can uh, uh, yeah, what's it, simplify or that, uh, just uh, uh, make it simple uh, like uh, for uh, architecture dependent uh, code. Yeah, you can make uh, other or some uh, simple, simple what's say interface uh, for so, such kind of uh, self-modifying code to that uh, update uh, later, yeah. So you think our, you like our current approach? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, current yeah. approach is, uh, yeah. It, it seems that our, uh, the model is very good. You well, know? I mean, we thought we liked it too, like yeah. two years ago when we implemented it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to be the source of um, a large percentage of our but sizable percentage of our bugs, and the bugs can be they can range anywhere from completely innocuous to panic your system, and you don't really yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, maybe you need to uh, implement some uh, test cases uh, for such a uh, corner cases so that are yeah. The, the problem is like with the jump labels, we recently discovered that we had a bug there that. We wouldn't have had test cases. We didn't implement it. So yeah. the problem is every architecture has its own kind of quirks and special sections and patching um, things. 
you know, at, at the same time, it's not that bad. And there, there are quirks, but it's not. I mean, sure, that are, in, in that are, uh, let's say, sections are uh, architecture dependent or uh, architecture in, uh, subsystem dependent? Depends on the features. Um, alternatives and para, paravert patching instructions are arch specific. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. Jump labels might be arch independent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, if you're worried about jump labels itself, I, I think that's something. It's one of the relatively new ones, and I think that it's when the RT kind of had the same problem with uh, implementing, or, you know, we had with interrupts. Everyone implemented interrupts differently, so we just went through and said, or told us collection said, screw it, I'm going to make all architectures do interrupts the same, mm -hmm. um, and implemented that, and that made RT a hell of a lot easier to get, go forward. We can do the same thing. If there's a problem with jump labels. I don't know um, uh, who's uh, Jason. Uh, Jason. Uh, who's Baron? Baron. J yeah, Jason Baron. Is he? Still, I haven't seen him in a while. No, he, he's not here. I think. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. So hopefully, uh, hope he's sort of almost MIA a little bit. But I'm all for making jump labels easier across arcs, and if that makes it easier for you, it's basically it would be. It's like I really personally don't care about uh, live kernel patching, um, but. For those that didn't care about RT, the way we got it in was we made their code better. So if yeah. we could make jump labors better, and because maybe alternatives too, like maybe maybe we could have generic alternatives yeah. and pair instructions. Yeah. So my point is, let's not find hacks around each architecture. Let's take back. Let's say let's see if we could fix the architect or fix the problem area to be easier for you, and in the same time make it easier for everyone. Because that's um, that would be a benefit. So those that don't care about live kernel patching, if you start changing things to make it easier for people, people will then start liking you. That's kind of how yeah. RT got in. Because yeah. no one cared about RT, but when we started improving things all the time, then people were like, oh, this is actually kind of cool. It's, they're helping us. Yeah. And so, that, that, would make other, that would make OBJ tools life easier too, right? So, and, and probably plenty of other tools. Oh, question. Um, just a comment. Uh, I think conceptually the current approach seems uh, the better one, uh, just conceptually. I, I know it has been a source of bugs, though um, uh, maintaining a fleet which will have uh, lots of live patches, let's say, or patches that keep coming in, uh, that approach probably works better. Uh, however, of the alternatives, uh, what is the most appealing to you right now to, to, to solve the problems that you have currently? It kind of, that's, from the discussion, it kind question. of felt like the blue sky idea is taking, uh, it, it seems like the most uh, appealing. Okay, so, uh, so I, I mean, the, the first one would be the simplest. Yes. Because to introduce a dependency is, is, is easy. It's, exactly. It's, it's so, so, yeah, and we did not discuss it enough, <laughs> in my view, so. Yes, but mm. the, I think, so it's, it's not a technical problem. So I, I think the problem is on, on the users or our customer's side. Because I think they would, some of them would be really unhappy with loading unneeded modules because they have a fixed set of modules which are allowed, and that's it. What? And not only modules, packages, everything. I mean, they're either compiled or not. They, if if they are compiled and available on the system, they expect them to be loaded. No, we, we, we live in a distribution world, so just it's set from our, on, on our yeah. side. So we could also split them into different packages, and then yeah. some of them might be optional. Yeah. And also, I think that uh, some customers also do some images of pre-installed system that they distribute to their yeah. computers, and they have just what they need there. Now, and the problem with that is how do you split out the live patches that you've built? Uh, what goes into the base package and how do you split out yeah, the live patches? Yeah. That oh, of course. But, uh, I, yeah, that, that's a problem. And the other one is that this is, of course, all hypothetics because yeah. we don't know much about our customers' usage. So it just could be a good idea, maybe not. No one knows, but well, I'm hesitant to even try it. Why? <laughs> Just scared. No, like, yeah, okay. So, right. That, so that's not the good reason. I think you agree with that as well. It's just. Well, well, well 
it's, it's a good reason if you care about your customers so, or care about your users. So you just don't want to... But what I mean is there is no data to justify it either way right yes, now. That's, and, that's and, true. And that's why it's not a good reason to rule it out right now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But... but. but. <laughs> it, it, it could be because for the exactly same reason, because you, d you don't know. So the question is whether you like more to play on a safe side or, or, or not. I'm meaning if you want to get your customers to do a non likable situation or, or not. So just hmm. we don't, I think. Uh, there was actually one more idea that's probably not mentioned there. Actually, uh, refuse uh, load uh, modules that could be live patched and are no not loaded at the moment when the live patch was installed, like so that like prevent loading modules that would have these troubles. But uh, it's also problematic because, for example, some USB devices just needed to load modules that according to what device is attached. And we don't know what customers do. They might do some regular maintenance or something like this, or in case of problems, it might need to go there with some tool and attach it and to solve something, and so it would prevent them. So, um, so, so I just okay, want to just say ahead. one last thing is, uh, I'm gonna go back, because I mentioned this a few years ago, was the saying is, I still find it kind of stupid to be loading a patch, or loading a module that, that you have to patch, since you're loading it anyway, What's the reason why you just can't fix that module or have have a way of at least patching it? Maybe patch it in user space, or and I know you have to sign it or something. Probably it's probably a signing issue. And is that the case, or is I think that's the blue, blue sky idea. Right? Uh, would you say that's the blue sky uh, idea? I, I think so. So that is one of the one of the things we've considered, um, but that has some downsides as well. I think also the fact that. We, I, we haven't discussed this, but we talked about this today. Um, the fact that um, all the modules you're patching might not be loaded when you when you load it, uh, the, the live patch. That that means that you still need to do kind of granular, you know, per object, um, you know, sections. So it might not bias. We still might have to have that complexity of having per per module jump label sections and per module alternative sections and things like that. And, and then it's not worth it. Yeah, because that would have been the big <laughs> benefit of it would be to get rid of those sections, but might have to, might need them anyway. Yeah, and, and the answer to your question is still the same. So it's just because you you never know when you like your system, uh, the version of that existing loaded module. So it could be the non-fixed one from a year ago, or it could be a new one fixed as to your proposal, so you just don't know. So you would have to have different or a couple of versions of a life patch and apply them accordingly to what's what's in the system. And that, that that's the problem. I mean, so it sounds like, why do you have to have your life patch module fix more than one module code? Can't you just make it one per module? Is that part that, of that, that's, 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 that's the second idea. Second. And I mean, well, this is part of that because then you do the whole thing. If the module is not there, you just don't load it, and or have a way of changing your tool to live patch the actual module itself. So when the module is loaded, it just calls a different function at the point there. You can, yeah. might be able to have a. Have you looked into doing that? So, Peter, do do you want? Uh, so it increases the like the complexity of generating uh, live patches. Uh, because uh, no, as we do it now, then uh, we release some product and then do maintenance updates of the kernel. And together with the maintenance update, we also provide live patches from the critical security fixes for the already released kernels, which means the original one and also the already released maintenance update. So for it, so. It means that the number of uh, live patches that we need to prepare is like growing 
with, with the time. And we, we, together with the life patch, also distributes like different versions of the, the modules that can be loaded or, or not. Then we will not only need to release increasing number of life patches, but we will have also like for the same life patch support different versions of some module that has been like fixed no, in no, the past. No, what I'm saying is why can't you do that? So what you said was when you add a new life patch, atomically you switch, if there's already been patched, do you throw out every, is it the whole, everything in that module or is, there, or is it just the function? Uh, everything patched, so everything all the, in all those previous life patches. So, so wait, if I had function A patched and I add a new life patch that's Yeah. <laughs> so um, you have a um, say if you have function A patched, and then you add a new live patch that patches function B. Do you have to actually do make it so it patches A and B again, and just throw away the old A and make it A B again, or or do you just patch B and have two live patches living at the same time? No, the, the the former one. So you you patch both. Yes. A okay. And your patch. So that actually makes things really easy. This is no. I'm saying is okay. So you go in, you could have your tool that loads this. Say, this module doesn't exist, and I need to patch it. Find where it's, it ha if you know where that module exists, live patch the actual module on in user space where it's not been loaded yet. You know where the address is, it has a no-op, we're using uh, uh, FJ, so you just go change that no-op to point to a, the function, so if someone jumps, switch that to a jump to the new code, and patch it, and you can have it in a separate section so that you could throw it away and re-add it so if you need, so you just when you do this, you just constantly update the the modules online. So you don't have this crazy thing. It's either the modules are going to be all. In fact, actually, I would do that to all modules regardless. So if they unload it and load it, now you have a direct. It's not using F trace anymore. It's just doing a direct jump now because you could do this easily in in user space because you don't have traces. Understand what I'm saying? So if you have a section of where like a live patch or like you know fixed section. And then you put the code of all the new functions in that section, in that module, in the, K, the .ko module. And then when it's loaded, you don't touch the, co the actual code, but the first, that no op location just changes to be jump to the new guy. And, <clears throat> well, okay, yeah, module, you may be able to, a module signing, yes, but the thing is, if your module, and also if you know, it's, like, if you're going to update a new module, you, this has got to be a live patch, so actually you can just you could actually just update the new modules. Which makes it a little bit more difficult when you want to actually be able to turn the patch on and off during runtime, which we currently support. You can actually revert the patch. <coughs> and actually, it doesn't because it's still a jump. You just disappear, remove it, and then when you if you enable it again, then you have it go through the old section. And so everything will be exactly, basically exactly the same. Uh, I'm saying with the solution where you are actually replacing the whole thing on the face, you just back and forth. Oh, yeah. I mean, when, when you would do the replacing on disk, the whole KO uh, rewriting back and forth, then you actually would have to store both versions somewhere, right? When you are switching the patch or yeah, on and I mean, off. Yeah, but the thing is, like I said, I still think it, it solves so many things, much more, than trying to fight all the, you know, this, okay, I'm loading a module, now I have to bring it in later, and that is so much more complex. To me, I think that is so much more complex than just doing everything on, on disk and then loading it when you need to load it. And then you can actually monitor it and see it, and you can just sign, maybe have change it so you have partial sign. So you can actually have, like, you know, the cable, like a double section in the module that you can have signing for both of them somehow. So when, you, when yeah. your, your tool fixes it. If we have uh, signed modules and we have module which is unpatched, which is staying on the hard drive, and we want to patch it, we obviously will break the signature. Uh, in this case, our live patch should be also signed, right? Mm -hmm. Couldn't both files be combined and their signatures to be checked together? So, so if we are loading a module, uh, I suppose it has a header which says how long is the, it's the, alpha, it's the alpha. yeah. So we can check whether the file is longer than that, and to see that at the end of the first elf, 
we have a valid second elf, which is obviously the wife patch. We can then check the signature attached after that. I mean, change the signature in code. Um, so, so I'm saying is you can. Yeah. Okay. So, I just real real quick. I really do strongly believe you should take a bigger effort. I'll, I have several ideas about this because I thought about this before from the last time, and I still think it's better. And especially since you're more worried about building on top, we're not building on top. We're just going to replace it, having a separate section where the code is. So, like, if you need to add a new light patch, you just blow it and add and blow away the old one, put in the new section and change it, and you should even know what that, you could even put a signed signature in there because you should know what the end result is. So you could do everything on your own thing, so when you supply the live patching and you gotta change the modules online, you know exactly what, that, what the end result of those modules will be, so you should easily just send, a, send the signature and then update it and then that should already match. And I think this should be in a separate file rather than the same, modifying the same KO, uh, so when, uh, the module loading code should accommodate for an extra file, uh, which should probe for is there a live patch available for this module and load that along with the module. So the signing code remains uh, separate as well. Also, it accommodates for the module removal case where yeah. a live patch comes into the system, uh, which is already loaded. Then you unload the module, the live patch goes back. But then if you have a separate uh, live patch queue for that module uh, on the disk, you can reload it again. Uh, both of them. Yeah, that, I like that. Yeah. Okay, we gotta move on. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Who's next? <laughs> then I'll be back here. Yeah, to the back. It's my turn. Yes, yes it, it is your turn. I saw that when we moved it, and they had the two there. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to be at both. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is uh, Nikolai Stanger. I work for SUSE and during the past last year on automating source-based live patch creation in particular. Um, who is not aware about the idea behind or the concepts behind source-based live patch creation? I assume everybody, hands up who knows it. So, okay, okay, so I make it really quick. So what you usually want to have Oh, what we want to have is we want to create our live patches as external modules in source code, which means we have to copy everything from the Linux kernel sources over to our external module code, basically. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's a stupid task, right, for me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm usually doing it manually. Um, and so I've worked on automating that, and so the, the scale P, CCP utility is the result. CCP is for C, copy and paste, in case you wondered. Um, and how it works, it, it basically takes a bunch of options and um, the original GCC command line from the original kernel build from, let's say you're, you're um, patching KVM into, you would have something like vmx.c and the command line used to compile vmx.c. Um, it takes the complete command line because it needs to reproduce the preprocessor environment, which includes things like macro definitions, um, header search path, and so on and so forth. Um, when invoked, it would, um, ah, one more thing to note is it, um, it is given the set of patched function from which to build the source closure if you want, like like um, needed functions and type definitions and whatnot. So when invoked, it will pre-process, parse, evaluate, um, and out of that information, it will build the closure, which means, for example, it will follow the call graph of the, starting from the, from the patched set, it will follow the call graph um, and copy, for example, functions, static functions, for example. L or structs, local struct definitions, or pull needed headers in, and something like that. Um, and the final step, it deprocesses the closure <laughs> um, and writes the output to, to a file. So, 
Um, are there any questions? Or please ask, because I'm so often <laughs> doing this. Uh, maybe something unclear. But no? OK. So um, when, when, in particular, when building the closure of the patched function kpccp, has to know some pieces of information about the original kernel build. And when implementing this, um, I, I put that problem aside and decided I would just um, invoke some, some external user-provided user scripts providing me with that, um, with that information. So for example, an example would be what I call externalization is exactly kind of what we talked about um, with the static um, static keys. So if you if you need to access a global variable from the original patched objects, you have some some somehow have to resolve it. So and that's what I call externalization, whether or not it's possible, and so on. So and um, what I'd like to do do in this talk is to collect ideas and opinions to obtain various pieces of information about the original kernel build. So, um, so the first thing is the, um, the GCC command line used uh, when compiling the, um, the patched object. So there are several ideas I had. So the first one is to just uh, run make in silent mode. Um, and, uh, and in simulation mode <laughs> in particular, and um, um, and copy the uh, the command line out of of the output. The problem with that is that it depends on the GCC version because Kvolt um, adds and removes certain options depending if the compiler supports it or not. So if you want to reproduce your build on a different machine than used to compile the <coughs> kernel, it won't work. Um, another problem is that there are some targets with, which are always rebuilt, which basically clutter the output, and yeah, it's it's not good for automation or extracting the output. So another idea is to um, to somehow store away or package away or whatever the .cmd files produced by Kvilt for. Uh, tracking whether or not some compilation <coughs> command has changed. So, yeah, the disadvantage of that is basically that um, these contain absolute path, and um, yeah, so you can't move your. Uh, oh, I mean, you can, but you have to fix up your path. So, but you can't move your configured configured kernel directory or whatever to somewhere else. So. On the upside, the nice thing about these .cmd files is that it also contains the headers, which is good for, or which is needed for finding um, objects to patch for header file changes. <coughs> so, so these, basically these are the output from GCC minus M something <laughs> to, to create these make file routes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the, 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 the um, simplest one or stupidest one is just to capture the whole make output from the kernel compilation and <laughs> grab for your file of interest or something. Um, so what exactly do you need from the kernel, I mean from the GCC command line? Right now I need the um, everything preprocessor related, like macro definitions, undefs, um, header, search file, header search path, and yeah, that's it. So, but I'm, I'm for for simplicity, simplicity. I'm taking the whole GCC command line and throw away what I. Do. And for okay, one one thing, um, and the f in 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 the sh short future, future or in the near future, future, um, what I would like to do is to warn on um, on architecture specific flags, um, altering the code generation somehow. Like for example, you could do something. Just as an example, I don't know if it's actually used. You can have fpack struct, which would affect your live patch, obviously. And there are some changing calling conventions, for example. Mm. And I want to do something like that. So, and so I decided to just take the whole thing and <laughs> pick what I need. So, yeah. 
And another reason is uh, that I thought that it would probably facilitate automation if I just can pass the whole command line, get it somewhere, and just throw it at KMT CCP. Yeah, but are there any any um, more ideas how to get that command line or comments? There's a remark. <laughs> oh! <laughs> so, um, I've seen a lot of this recently just for, like, editor integrations. Yeah, sure. I've seen a lot of this recently for editor integrations where people will have ClangD or whatever and they'll produce a, there's a common file format called compile commands.json, um, which essentially includes how to compile every single um, C file in the links tree. So there's already tools to generate that. Um, I've seen scripts that will just go through and you know parse every .o.cmd file, and there's also a tool called bear, B-E-A-R, which you just prefix, like if you do bear make, it'll just spit out this JSON file, which you know remembers how to build everything in the kernel, um, which is very useful for editor integrations, right? So you know whenever I change a file in Emacs, it'll go ahead and recompile and give me some you know intelligent warnings and whatnot. So um, I guess there's already some work to make that easier, not for this purpose, but you could probably, you know, okay, thanks. make use of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's very good information to have. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you after this. Session. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. What's your point? Yeah, I'll meet things. you at. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's somewhere, yeah, right. Who can I wound? <laughs> Proxy. <laughs> uh, recently, I run in nearly the same situation as you, but for other purposes, I'm maintaining something like 20 running kernels on several hundred thousand. So, so, uh, I'm, not sure uh, I'm in the same situation as you. I'm uh, maintaining maybe something 10, 15 kernels, up to 20 sometimes, yeah. running on several hundred to thousand machines. Uh, and I was in a situation where when I have to build live patch, I have kernels built over the last two years with several different tool chains yeah, exactly. meanwhile changed. Yeah. And it was a real pain to investigate which kernel with which tool chain was built, uh, what the build options were, and so on and so on. Uh, Generally, what I did is uh, build .env file where I'm setting up my toolchain, uh, source uh, toolchain something yeah. enable, yeah. Uh, and I'm adding this uh, file to the uh, git from which I'm building the kernel to the exact release or to the archive of the release or whatever you use uh, to maintain your files. Uh, using that, uh, I can use uh, unified script build kernel, let's say, uh, which does all the flags, options, whatever yeah. we need into the command line, and just includes build.env. When you have your uh, build.env file, which sources the toolchain, uh, checks its version whether it is exactly what you expect. Uh, in my case, it enables C cache and some other stuff, but basically yeah. set up the built environment. You, 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 could, you could take just the file and uh, source it. Then you will reproduce your exact built environment uh, used yeah. for building the kernel, which made my life easy. Yeah, yeah I, I, the problem with that approach is that it would be hard to set it up with cross compiling, I guess. I, because what what I would love to do is to do all this on my development machine, <laughs> and not having to. I mean, if you have like 50 kernels and three architecture or something like that, then it's getting real a real pain to do that on every on every architecture and search for a machine <laughs> somewhere. And, and yeah. but yeah, yeah, that's certainly an option. So um, you could also use containers, I guess. If, you know, use a container to build the kernel and then save that away, then you know that. you have the exact environment, you know, used. 
to build the kernel, you can build your lot patch models with as well. <laughs> So any more, more comments on that? I suppose not. Okay, thanks. And let's head, head over to the next topic. So that's the topic of externalizability of mostly static functions. And what that, what that means is, so when building the closure of the patched functions, closure with respect to the call graph, basically, um, there, there's an um, optimization possible to um, sometimes to leave out a function and refer to the original in kernel instance instead. So, for example, that's possible um, when 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 obviously that function hasn't to be changed and uh, GCC emitted it without any um, interprocedural and um, optimization into the patched object. So, then the question is. Um, how to find out if that has happened. So if, if, if GCC emitted uh, um, some, some function of interest um, into the life, uh, into the to be patched object. And it turns out it's harder um, than I expected it to be. Um, <laughs> because yeah, there's several um, options. So first you can just have a look at the symbol table and see if it's there or not. Um, and the problem with that approach is, is that there are, that in the same patched object you can have incompatible definition of, of a function, or function with the same name. So, and it's actually a real concern. There's an example from NFS. So another um, option is to inspect the output of the um, IPA dump from GCC, which we are storing anyway. The problem with that is, is that uh, it doesn't have any records for uh, dead code elimination. So it could happen that some function is not, um, yeah, has been optimized away completely and it would not have a record in these um, IPA dumps. So that on its own won't suffice either. Um, then I was thinking about to, uh, we already have the source information, uh, the source location information from KPCCP, like line number and column or whatever, and we could relate that to um, dwarf info, in principle, um, and, and, and see if, if, yeah, if there's a corresponding um, dwarf entry for that function at that line, and having some instance we would recognize it at um, checking if there's an address stored in the dwarf entry, a, te a, a dot text address. Um, and the problem with that is that um, optimized clones are not distinguishable from proper out of line instances. So. Uh, okay, so first remark is the dwarf. Uh, I once asked. Uh, about using Dwarf for IPA clone stump, so in, instead of it. Uh, the answer was that Dwarf, in terms of optimizations, is not so reliable as you noticed. Yeah. It's so that, <laughs> and that we should not use it or try to use it. So then I asked for IPA clone stump, which was implemented. So yeah. maybe the, the best would be to ask to add that code elimination to the dump as well. Because GCC has to has to make a yeah. decision about it at some point, so maybe, maybe it is easy to to dump it. So you point. mean we would ask the GCC guys to have IP, IPA dump complete, like having every function emitted into the final object could, recorded into could some, be. Some, having some record something in that something file. like like this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that. Um, in particular, this um, relating source location information to actual symbol entries is that we need that for KLP convert as well. So, and, I mean, if you want to somehow pass this information down the chain, like through KLP CCP to KLP convert, uh, to, for example, to resolve um, clashing symbols. Um, 
yeah, we, we will basically only have, the only option is to look at dwarf, I think. Because that would allow us to relate the source location information to the dwarf entry and to the um, address of the symbol and tell KP convert, um, yeah, that's the symbol you want or, <laughs> or you don't want. So I, I mean, what I don't like is that there's like three sources I have to combine somehow. <laughs> um, and yes, IPA clones, is, if, if we can have that from the GCC guys, would be much better for only deciding whether or not some, some, some uh, function is there or not. But in the long term, it might make sense to somehow have line, to be able to correlate uh, source location information to uh, similar addresses. Uh, okay, so let's ask about dwarf situation first, if it can be fixed somehow, or I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I know. So, so that's my proposal. <laughs> so let's find out first, and yeah. then, then decide. Okay. So that's uh, and then the last question is: uh, Would it make sense to? come up with some convention for retrieving these IPA clones, which are, which are these, these clone dump files. I mean, as opposed to everybody having his own scripts and his own conventions, and I don't know. But I think we can't decide right now. I yeah. think it depends on the final pipeline too much. So yeah. Let's first come up with a pipeline and then and discuss. decide on a, yeah. So uh, that's my question. So what about, what about the timeline and pipeline and everything? So are you? I mean, it, I'm using it since a week or so. <laughs> what exactly, uh, <laughs> timeline for what? I don't yeah, because I, I think if we, maybe ask first. Okay. <laughs> I've just I, so I took a quick look at the code, yeah. and it looks like it's a lot of code, right? So I was wondering, like, the is it complex? Is it complex, and is that a concern? <laughs> yes, it is complex, but in a way, I mean that that's all. Or there's been some things specific to the C language or how macro processing works or stuff like that. So yeah, it's complex to do the deep preprocessing. The point is. I have test cases for everything of that, so like testing each aspect of the deprocessing part and like that, and I consider it a soft problem, so <laughs> and I don't <laughs> expect bugs in that part. I mean, what of course is still not ready is, um, for example, what or what could be a source of fragility would be uh, to turn the GCC command line into some preprocessor environment which I try to reproduce basically from the GCC version and uh, command line. So because there's, there's uh, for example, a predefined macro from GCC, just to give an example. On, I mean, for another example is if you give GCC a minus O for optimize, it would define this optimize macro, which is actually used in the Linux kernel. And yeah, stuff like that. So, I mean, <laughs> on the other hand, the GCC sources are very well organized in that respect, so it's probably hard to miss anything there. So if something broke in that area, <clears throat> like what would be the, what would be the fail mode? Like would it be, could you anticipate like it corrupting the patch module? And yeah, ideally the fail mode, the most common failure mode would be to have a non-compilable live patch module. I mean, if you get, <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. So, yeah, but okay, there's, there's still another point I've, um, I <laughs> haven't solved yet is uh, pragmas. So you, the most pragmas in the Linux kernel are di diagnostics. So I just, in the beginning, I just threw every, <laughs> every pragmas away, but <laughs> some are not. So for example, there's an uh, fpeg struct analog uh, pragma, and these are actually used at like three or four places, and yeah, So I, I think the more sources of um, 
of, of errors or something will, will be in the scripting around it, like in the getting the um, getting the, the information about the symbols from GCC and something like that. So uh, you are actually already using this? Yeah, since, I mean bit? since last week. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay, so, so let me ask about next steps. So what's your what's your proposal? Because you you're surely not asking us to review that monster. <laughs> yeah, please, you? please review KPCCP <laughs> <laughs> for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will meet next year, right? So yeah, it's uh, like seventy thousand lines of code to come back to that question. <laughs> so <laughs> so seventy thousand. Yeah, at sixty nine something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, for the most part, it's the, it's the C evaluation and stuff like that. So the actual deprocessing and closure building would be something like 5,000 probably. So that's where the live patching specific logic is. So, and so yeah. Yeah, the next steps. I, I mean, I would, of course, love if people start using it or trying it out. Um, I personally would... Um, Appreciate any feedback on the on the command line on the script interface so, and what can be improved about that, and and yeah. So and so my conclusion is that we don't won't have any upstream changes to cable or whatever, but use the tool the person the back <laughs> propose yeah and yeah. Any. More questions or comments? Doesn't seem to be the case. Hi, uh, I'm Kamlesh Bhavla. I work with uh, Linux Technology Center at IBM. So uh, this is more about like an update of what's happening with object tool support on PAR. Uh, OK, uh, I tried to fit the one slide rule. So it is like divided. And I'm like, so we'll go <laughs> with the left one first and the right next. So uh, last year when we had the talk, uh, Actually, there was like zero line of code actually written. So most it was like pitching the idea on like what we have on par, what can be done. And I was just asking for whether it's the right way to go. Because I was honestly a little scared looking at uh, what Josh did with Awk Unwinder. And I was a little scared whether I should do something similar for par. Right. So then, uh, so uh, the current state as of now, it's like, I would say it's in a pretty good shape. I have not posted it as such, but it's available on the GitHub as such. You, you can start, you know, if anyone is interested before it hits LKML, you can just start, you know, you can just, it's public, so you can start running around your power boxes. So one thing is like, uh, uh, it, so the object tool is all about enforcing rules of how and, you know, how the stack is at a particular point or how we do the stack validation at a particular point. So. Uh, the major part is be, would be is like to enforce a particular set of rules, you're going to go through every instruction in a .o file and make sure that you know, you know it follows set of uh, ABZ rules. So the most of this outline thing of like enforcement of rule and all those things are there. So the major work was like on the decoder part. That's the biggest meat, which is required for every arc to be supported as such. So. Uh, uh, this is uh, the, the decoder for par is not like a very big or it doesn't covers all the cases, but it it just is a very small one which has only for those which you are interested from the perspective of object tool as such. For other thing, it's just like uh, we don't care. I'm like none type is what we declare as of now. So uh, oh yeah, and I have copied or say borrowed from what we have in our lib step where we generally do a decode. Uh, we have a decoder, which does a lot more than what is required for object tool as such. So I just picked up uh, small bits and pieces and just group of instructions which we are interested in from there. And, and the first thing to start would be is like the 
stack operation is what uh, first group of operation which a decoder as we are interested is like uh, what is the current state of stack and the instructions which manipulate these stacks. So the reason is like whenever you allocate, you make sure you deallocate before you either return from the function or whenever you do a jump or call to an external function. You know, those kinds of things. And the second one which we are interested in is all about the branches, either conditional, unconditional. And we are a part, guys. I mean, they know that kind of, uh, the number of instructions we have for different kind of branches are like huge. And uh, we have like interesting things like branch with LR set, unset. And we have a lot different kind of branches. Uh, okay, let's not get into it, but yeah. It, it was like a huge operation which we needed. And another interesting thing would always be is like dead ends. So if, for example, you're passing through a whole function and you want to make sure you pass through or you, uh, you want to make sure that every instruction is reachable from uh, entry to exit. And there might be cases where you have bug on, bug or bug on or worn on, or even uh, those who translate to dead ends. That's like the code would not go below it. So uh, figuring out those things. And okay. And one interesting thing with PAR comes is like the switch case. So the switch case uh, will be like, okay, it's like something like this. If you see this, right, uh, like what I explained, you have to go through, uh, whenever you have a dead end, the instructions below that would never be reachable. And something similar happens with switch also. So, uh, so here. Uh, you have all those things, and these are the cases over here. So BCTR would be like from this would be kind of a dead end, and you will not be able to go to case zero, case one, default, and all. All those things are nothing but the case zero would be something somewhere here, or case one would be below it, and those are the instructions which you might not be able to reach generally. So uh, <coughs> what I mean is like for the switch cases, we need a uh, special way of figuring out if it's a switch table or not. And thanks to Arm, guys, and Josh, that they came up with an interesting GCC plugin, which I have, uh, you know, kind of reused it. Thank you for that. So, yeah. And uh, we have, like, a lot of interesting prologue sequences, which are like uh, uh, the local entry point and the global entry point kind of a thing, which needed to be taken care of, uh, what would that mean is like the entry would start with offset 8, not with 0. So uh, we have a little, uh, okay, something like this. I'll, I'll, I'll better show you how it looks like. You would have something like this. So uh, if you see, right, the first one would be like, it's no opcode, nothing, it's just 0. Something like that. We needed to take care of that also as a decoder, but we are not interested for object tool as such. But one thing we are interested in is like, what is the start of the function as such? So you need to take care of you know, these kinds of uh, things. And yeah, and once you group all the instructions, the decoder is fine with, okay, we figured out like these are the instructions we need to, we are, you have grouped up all the instructions, then comes the stack validation point. And that is pretty awesome when it comes to power because by ABI definition, we do the right thing. But uh, the stack validation is uh, enforcement is more valid for the ASM code which we write by hand. That is where the enforcer, enforcement is something which is really required. And uh, on the kernel side, what we wanted was like certain annotations were missing. Like for example, bug on is not a dead end you can reach instruction below that. So you had to introduce a new uh, annotation. F I mean, you had to add annotation to bug on, worn on, and worn, which were missing. And once I started, you know, as a, uh, uh, okay. So once the rules started enforcing, I figured out that there is a lot of ASM cleanup which, which co will come up. And first thing would be like the end of function marker for handwritten assembly. So what we currently do as if now is, we say, oh, this is the beginning of the function, but we don't say where it ends. So those kinds of things are going to come, and we are going to have, uh, I guess we'll have a lot of cleanup as such. So that is the state as of now. And yeah, I'm sure I, I need to cover uh, 
I'm sure um, when I'm like testing more and more, I'm sure I'll, uh, I'll be able to cover a lot of other things which current object rule does. So this is the current state. As if now, any comments on that or? Uh, yes, I, I'm not sure. Ah, sorry. Uh, you mentioned the dead ends for bug on and warn on. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understood whether you reached uh, a conclusion on that, whether you had oh, a solution. So the thing is, like, we were missing annotations there saying that, you know, this is not the end of function. You have to go below that also. Because okay. for object tool, you're just parsing every instruction. You want to make sure yeah. that everything is reachable and you are, you're doing the right thing. So for example, after bug on, what if, what if, if you're calling a function? So, okay, let's put it this way. You have a bug on and then you're just calling a function yeah. without, I mean, it's just a theoretical example that you have not constructed the stack in the right way. So that's not the right thing to do, right? Mm -hmm. So if it is a dead end, then you say that, okay, this is the dead end and it's a no return point and you just stop the analysis there. Okay. Yeah, but uh, because on ARM, I realized that uh, it is possible to compile, depending on the configuration of the kernel, you can compile the bug ons out. Oh, okay. so, uh, so the, I don't remember the name of the conf uh, config option. And at least to me, it seemed like uh, the, the, it would almost make sense to consider the, the bug ons or the break operations or whatever is on PowerPC, at least on ARM, it's just a break operation that triggers an exception, like a no-op okay. that uh, would just go through because in the end, the, the final code can be either compiled with or without uh, and that, that uh, break instruction. And for the warns, the warns are not, I mean, you're supposed to be able to go through them. For, so anyway. For, uh, I guess uh, for us, it's always, uh, it, it's like a trap instruction. It generates trap instructions, so it's a. Yeah. So generally, classify them as dead ends, as if now. Yeah, and yeah. Then but we have so okay. This is how it is, right? So for for the thing is like for the object tool, what we want is like you want to reach everything, so you classify them as alternative instructions. So whenever there's a one on, it generates a tab, trap, but you say that oh, this is not a dead end. Go to the next instruction. Yeah, it's like a no op. It's uh, so, but for here we do this. I mean, for the bar, I do that. So. Okay. So yeah. you pass to the next instruction saying that you you have annotated it saying that it's not a dead end, go to the next instruction, carry on with your analysis kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of other interesting things like what happens if it's a void function, right? We don't, sometimes we don't have BLR or return from the function. That instruction is totally missing. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine, you don't have a red queue or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just don't have a BLR. And we have cases like where you have, we have a branch greater than I mean, written greater than kind of branches. So you, you're yeah. not coming down itself. You're just written, <laughs> you're running from middle of the function. So what happens to the rest, uh, second half of the function? Uh, for object tool, you're supposed to analyze second half also. Yes. So uh, what I do is like, uh, as of now, I call them as alternative. So what I say is like, uh, when you have such branches, the alternative instruction is the next instruction. Yeah. So you carry on with the uh, analysis of the whole function as such. So uh, we have these kinds of things, but these are just my idea. But I'm sure when I'm going to post to the mailing list, people are going to beat the heck out of me, and I see one person already there. <laughs> yeah, just so. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Um, so you were saying you treat bugs as knobs uh, yeah. on ARM. Uh, uh, that was an idea. Oh, it's an idea, yeah, because I'm curious. I would kind of like if we did that, um, because you can actually return from a bug if you're clever, um, but I'm curious, would that actually break, would object tool not like that? I'm not sure, yeah. I haven't tested for uh, x86, but as far as I remember on the ARM64 case, it seemed to work fine, okay. so, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be configured like on x86, I think bugs are annotated by GCC to be no return. So this compiler already assumes you don't con return from it. If you did, bad things would happen. So OBJ tool kind of follows that same. Yeah. But 
uh, we have to move on. We have one more short talk before the break. So, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, on the future plans, like uh, before I posted my code, uh, Amgais had posted one of the really nice cleanup already. We have a object tool code floating for ARM. So uh, the good thing would be like if we can get the ARM code merged in because it has a lot of cleanups already. And my current patch set is based on it because uh, more or less the cleanups are similar. So I'm just reviewing it over the ARM code. It'll be nice if you know people can test more of it or just review it more and get the ARM thing in so that the power PC thing will be very easy for me to get it in. And <laughs> so the reason why I'm saying is like it decouples a lot of things. I mean, the, it's a nice work where are dependent independent pieces have done. But my personal opinion is like, uh, once we get all the three things in, then possibly uh, there are a lot of other cleanups which I would like to do, especially with uh, the art bits and the non-art bits. Because I, I, I want to do that because it's it's still more art specific even after the cleanup, so that's, uh, that's my thing. And uh, possibly use the same GCC plugin uh, which does the switch table detection as common between power and arc, I mean arm. And uh, the last thing would be is like it records more and more of testing. As of now, I've just tried it on one particular GCC version and I'm not aware of all the subset of instructions which are generated over the power. That means that I'll need to try at least like two or three versions of compiler before posting it. And I'm sure there are like a lot more trickier instructions which I need to take care of. And uh, the current idea which I'm using for all those things has always been alternative instructions, which are dead end for me. And uh, I'm sure there are like a, very, a more smarter way of doing things. So I'm just going to push it sometime later this year. And yeah, please review it and let me know what you guys think about it. And thanks a lot for last year when you pitched up a lot of ideas. So it, it did help a lot. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Joe Lawrence from Red Hat. I work on the Kpatch team. So I know we're, we're running a little late, so um, this uh, talk is pretty quick and simple. Um, slide one almost speaks for itself, and that is, do we need a live patch developer's guide? But uh, quick, uh, quickly, I'll just go over, for people maybe not familiar with uh, our existing uh, live patch documentation, uh, we have a bunch of files in the tree that cover uh, a range of subjects, and um, I think the documentation is actually really good. Um, and you know, for every subject, you know, describes you know, how the feature works, how you might use it, um, maybe a little bit of history, and and some of the sections even have uh, use cases sprinkled in there. Um, so. Um, like I said, this pretty much covers, I think, all the, all the current features um, that Live Patch supports. Um, on the other hand, the Kpatch project kind of took um, a different angle in, in, in as far as documentation. Um, and we have a developer's guide on GitHub that um, covers this set of um, um, subjects, very similar to um, the live patching ones. However, um, we kind of document from the perspective of a, a, a patch writer who may have a question um, and not know spe specifics about um, any particular subject. So for example, um, I'll just go back real quick. Um, so even though I think I wrote probably a lot of the unpatching callbacks documentation, I have to go back to it a lot to kind of verify, oh, you know, how does it work? How did we implement it? Um, that said, if somebody didn't know about the unpatching callbacks or they didn't know about shadow variables, um, I, they, I guess we just have to go read through the entire list of documentation. So um, the question that I had is that, uh, the, the current kpatch author guide um, is out of date and it references some deprecated features. It's um, talking about um, the days when Kpatch carried its own uh, helper module to 
support things like callbacks and shadow variables and things like that. Uh, and at the same time, it doesn't reference some of the new features that we have upstream, like atomic replays. Um, so um, if we're in the space of needing to uh, update the kpatch guide, um, the question I kind of had for live patch developers is whether or not um, the documentation that we have upstream for live patch in the kernel is sufficient for everybody if it's easy to understand and you know in a format that's uh, easy to digest or you know maybe there's some some ways that we can make it better and easier to uh, to uh, understand so um, this is the last slide and these were the potential options um, the first one is pretty simple yeah maybe everything's great we don't need to do anything um, another option um, when one of the kpatch developers eventually gets around to updating our documentation for kpatch build, um, maybe we can extract some of the, uh, the live patch um, relevant pieces and put that upstream. Um, maybe some other ideas are just make a, a file of frequently asked questions. Um, and we get these a lot on the, the kpatch mailing list or the GitHub um, you know, issues when people try to do something. Um, maybe we can just refer them to the relevant um, RST file. Like, oh, you know, I want to do this thing. Go see shadow variables. Um, uh, and then the final ideas, which are probably a lot more work, um, could include uh, just going over various, um, you know, exist existing CVEs and when people go and fix them. Uh, you know, what did they do? You know, what were some of the um, challenges that they had and, and how did they go about um, fixing that? Like I think Nikolai did this uh, a while back for, for one of the, um, the uh, meltdown. Melt, was it Meltdown? Yeah. Okay. And it was a very interesting read. So um, anyway, those are just kind of some of the ideas I had and I wanted to see what you guys thought. So, yes, so, so I think, does it work? Okay. So I think the answer to all of those is yes. Well, we'd like to have yes to everything's perfect. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yes, as, uh, we, we like to have everything like this. I, I, so yesterday, uh, Jonathan complained uh, in his talk that the current documentation folder is a huge pile of different things. So, so there's Pro kernel process development documentation. There's a documentation for administrators. Uh, there's there, there are docs for kernel developers and user documentation as well. So that it should be sorted somehow. And currently, I think we only have kernel developer documentation. So explaining features and uh, the design of live patching. So I think it's great idea to, to have a document, documentation for users as well. So explaining stuff with like examples. Okay, um, so w one small reservation I have with the, the user side of things is that I think there's various implementations. Are you using kpatch load? Are you using kgraph, et cetera? A um, at least kgraph is obsolete in a way, so don't okay. worry about it. So that's one thing which sure. could be crossed out. But I think, no, upstream live patch, for example, because I, I, I don't know about your future plans if you if you plan to migrate to from K patch to, to upstream. Um, I think right now we're still kind of an open mind about either one, right? We're, they're both kind of still, we have some ideas about how to improve the object-based like K patch build approach, and I know you know, Joe and Nikolai and others are working on the source-based source, source -based approach. So we're gonna just kinda, we, we wanna make a decision, but we don't think, we don't think we're in a place to make a decision yet to okay. answer that question. Okay. So one of, so I agree, uh, we need a developer and a user guide uh, that needs to be separate. Um, the kernel one is great, uh, live patch, uh, when I look at it, that's all there. But then when it comes to the user space tools to create, I don't know which ones to use. There's, there's of course, there's kpatch, there's kgraph, sure. there's um, probably something else. And um, 
as he just said, KCraft is being deprecated. But the other complicating factor is when I look at the KPatch tools, the KPatch documentation uh, refers to live patch in some places and the KPatch kernel module in some places. And KPatch, when it says KPatch, does it mean the KPatch user space tools or KPatch the kernel module, which probably no one um, yeah, is using when they're talking okay. about the upstream kernel one and so on. So it's it's complicated uh, in that way. Yeah, we have a so great yeah. namespace yeah. problem in, in the k-patch documentation. <laughs> so There's only so many different ways, yeah, you can say live patch, k-patch, et cetera. So, so uh, uh, one thing we could do always is like retain one which we we have for the, every time the feature goes in, uh, we have the developer guide as such and have something like uh, what we have for locking which Rusty did some time back uh, guide for the people, the authors who are going to author a live patch as such, which is a little common. I mean, if it's just a guide for users as such, which exist. So possibly, I, I'm not sure, we want both the documentations, right? One for the developer explaining the feature as such, which we would, I mean, we do it always, but the user guide would be like. So it seems like um, the people definitely like the idea of, a, of a, some user documentation. Um, do we feel that the kernel documentation is in a good enough place, or do we feel that that needs maybe a little bit more hand-holding? So the the kernel documentation has currently how to, how to load, like what what what, what is the technology behind uh, the life patch and how to load and unload that kind of stuff. Sure. So, um, but it can be the it can be the one location to have both the uh, creation uh, documentation as well as the tech, like you can have both things merged together in a, in a single stream. I think that would that would make. And we're seven minutes into the break right now, yeah. so uh, if you want any snacks or anything, it's only open during the break. So I would say we stop right here. Yes, we could come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So my name is uh, Petr Mládek. I'm working for SUSE and I will to talk about uh, new API for uh, handling uh, system state changes that done by live patches. Um, it was an API that was uh, discussed last year and uh, it uh, is needed usually for changes done by live patch callbacks. Uh, and for example, one situation was the L, uh, L1, L1TF. L1TF vulnerability when uh, it was about inverting some uh, byte in page tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah and actually, uh, we would, could not do this before all the code, all the system was able to handle this bit correctly. So it, uh, the live patch did the way that it uh, updated the code and then uh, the system was uh, transitioned uh, so that every task was able to handle to invert it uh, a bit. And then in post uh, transition callback, uh, we finally started to invert this bit to uh, prevent the vulnerability. And uh, why we need the API? Uh, it's uh, related to atomic replace and maintaining live patches because when we produced another live patch that will fix some more security fixes, then it needs to know what's already on the system. Uh, so if uh, there is live patch that already did this change or didn't, if it actually needs to uh, convert the bits or not, uh, and so on. And also if uh, there might be another version of the fix that it okay needs to know what, what's the situation that is taking over. And also, uh, we actually uh, currently don't have uh, any way how to uh, create like dependencies or 
uh, define some compatibility between live patches because we actually even allow to install older live patch that will basically replace the new one. But in this case, uh, it wouldn't work because the older live patch would introduce code that wouldn't be able to handle this inverted bit and the system would crash. So we, we needed or we wanted to have some API that would help to keep, uh, to help with maintaining this and making it say, uh, safe. On the other hand, uh, this is something that is rarely used, so we wanted to make it simple. So uh, I came up with, with this API. It's currently uh, sent us uh, its uh, second versions of the patch set is sent and it got relatively positive feedback. Anyway, what it does, it introduces a uh, structure called a state that has just uh, three members ID which describes, which is some uh, number that defines what the system state we are we are monitoring or changing. Uh, the developer of the live patch will ju just choose one. Then there is version. It's uh, again number, which means which version of the live uh, of the system state is this live patch introducing. And then some data that uh, get the callback store f for this state so that the new version of the live patch could uh, take over uh, and pass some information to the new version of the live patch. Or when the live patch gets disabled so it has some information how to actually revert the stuff. Uh, this uh, structure is uh, added to the top level structure called a live patch as, uh, and there might be array of these states so each live patch could handle more states independently. And now there are uh, three functions. One is uh, uh, calp is patch compatible and it's when you, uh, it's called, it's supposed to be called when the new live patch is enabled. And what it does, it that it's checking uh, the uh, system state that are already somehow uh, set by the already installed live patches and compare it with the states that the new live patch is going to change or is able to handle. And there is actually difference between uh, atomic replace or cumulative patch because this patch has to be able to handle all existing changes so, so that its uh, version provided, its, its array of the states has to be the same or higher than the already installed patches and it has to support all the states that are already manipulated by already installed patches. While the uh, patch that is not replacing the older patches, it is allowed to modify existing state. For this, the number has to be higher than already all the same or as already existing, but it doesn't have to handle all states. And yeah, and of course, patches could add new states or modify new states. And so this is the framework to handle the compatibility and then there are uh, two functions to manipulate the, the state. One is uh, get state that takes as an argument uh, pointer to the callable patch structure and typically it will be used in the callbacks and as a parameter it will get pointer to the locally defined variable uh, patch, which means the current patch, and the ID of that feature. And it will, this function just uh, simply search the array of the states and return the pointer where it's there. And so that uh, the 
uh, then you could access the data and so on. You usually don't need to care much about the version because you know your version and you know that when it, this is called that it already passed the check that you are compatible. And now uh, there is the other, other function that is needed to like take over or update the already existing changes and it's function uh, call p get preview state. It just takes ID and it search list of already installed live patches and search the array of states and return the structure from the last installed live patch that handle this state. And so that in the callbacks then you could use something like this, like if the previous state exists then you might reuse it or just do nothing or just copy the data or something like this. Or if it doesn't exist then you actually need to do the actual changes. And for example, in the pre-transition callback you might need to allocate the buffer for the data because this is the only place uh, uh, because the allocation could fail and pre-callback is the only callback that could fail and actually prevent the live patch from loading. And then in the post uh, patch callback you could fill the data and whatever you need to do, do there. So that's it. So did, did you actually try to implement the L1TF fix uh, using this API to see how much it actually makes things easier? Uh, not really. I, I made self-test when I did some artificial modification of console lock level. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I used the data to save the old value and they set some another level and yeah and the self te uh, self test is doing even update and so on and disabling and so and checks that the local level is handled like to so i hope that nikolai would <laughs> give his <laughs> opinion whether it would make him the life easier or more complicated or if it would be good enough for, for him. So yeah, I, I think it would solve the problem of this um, state management and um, yeah, I, I've seen that at, at the, uh, on the mailing list and I liked it a lot. So and I, I, I personally think it would work with live patches like A1TF, so it would solve the problem. I think, and it's simple, so, yes. Yeah. Great. So, any other questions, suggestions? Seems like you are matching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I acted already. Oh, hmm. huh? Yeah, okay, so I will, Fix some <laughs> English, <laughs> English words and strings, and send it. Okay. Push it. Good. Okay. Well so we, thank now you. Now we can start the bike sharing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I was afraid that Josh didn't look at it. No. In some deep. In some. Uh, no, I, I I looked at it and it looks looks good to me. Yeah, I haven't okay. looked at it in the detail. I mean, I'm sure I'll have some bike shed comments, like very minor, <laughs> minor things. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overall, yeah. I mean, it looks good. Okay. So, thank you. I don't mind. Who's the next? Joe. Much better. Um, hi, I'm Joe again, and um, so.
So I'll just start off with an apology that I have a lot of slides. Um, I didn't have time to make them shorter, sorry. And um, I'm owed a couple slides because I only had zero slides, I think, the last few years. So <laughs> I'm trying to catch up. So, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about KLP convert and live patch relocations. Um, this talk probably would have made a lot more sense before we had the big uh, late po module patching conversation. But um, for those who maybe missed some of those details, um, there's a lot of review as to um, what this patch set and what this tool is trying to accomplish and, and currently uh, what's the status of the patch set, you know, what's solved, what's, what's left. Um, so the history is that this has been around for a couple of years. Um, I think Josh posted the first RFC, maybe 2006, um, and then it's kind of been two, what, 2016, right? Um, and it's kind of been passed around, and I think I had um, a lot of comments for Joe uh, his version two. I think he eventually just said, "You can have it." So, <laughs> <laughs> so here I am, and uh, I just wanted to mention that the yeah, version five that's currently in progress has uh, a lot of great K-Build cleanup from uh, Masahiro um, and, uh, and review comments from Miroslav. So thank you guys. Um, so the very quick context of which this, what this patch set is doing um, is that this is not related to K-Patch build. Um, so it's not the, the easy three-step uh, build a reference, build a patch, and then combine them. Uh, and, and so this is uh, a tool that would be useful in the uh, incredibly simple source-based patching uh, model where you actually have C files and uh, sources um, that you're dealing with, not, not the binary you know, diffs. Um, so the main, main problem that uh, KLP convert tries to solve is what do you do about um, trying to access un unexported symbols uh, from your live patches. So if the kernel uh, defines something called hats or pretzel logic, and maybe uh, another kernel module defines a count it function, but they're static API, how can a live patch module, which is basically a regular module, how can you access those symbols? And if you try that today, uh, it's just not gonna work. Um, so the first um, workaround that comes to mind is K Olsen lookups, um, in which case you provide, I think, the string name and and maybe a bit of information about the object or the the symbol position. Um, it's essentially a way of like runtime querying. You get a pointer, so then all your code has to then kind of work through a pointer and direction. Um, so that, what if there was an automated way to do it? And that's what KLP convert. Um, seeks to do. Um, so what it does is it actually integrates as part of the build process. Um, so when you're building the kernel and building all the modules, um, we create a, a symbols list. And that list contains object files and a, a catalog of um, all the symbols that belong to, uh, to that object. So then when we go and we want to build a live patch module, We've uh, inserted a, a KLP script uh, that essentially says, okay, you're trying to access hats, you're trying to access pretzel logic, let's go consult the symbols list to find out um, to whom they belong um, so we know, you know what they are and uh, so that we can resolve them later when we uh, load your live patch module. So obviously the next question would be, well, how do you pull that magic off? Um, and the answer is relocations. And these are not just regular relocations that you know and love, but um, these are special um, live patch um, relocations. And what ends up happening when you, when you build your live patch module is that you'll have um, separate sections um, that have been sort of um, have a, a name encoded in the section name. As you can see, the, it's like a section name format. Um, so for things like hats and pretzel logic, um, we've put them in a, a KLP Rela VM Linux text section. Um, 
and the symbol names um, are, are sort of similarly uh, encoded with special names. So what ends up happening now is when you load your live patch module, um, as uh, documented by, I think, Jessica in, in module L format, um, the live patch core um, has, the, the, has code that basically runs through the relocations, looks for the specially named ones, and then um, can, can look up and resolve those relocations uh, at runtime. So as modules get loaded, or future modules get loaded, we can also resolve some of those as well. Um, so, um, right now, um, there, there is also uh, architecture-specific um, relocations, um, in which case we have uh, an x86 um, implementation um, that handles um, alt instructions and para instructions, but unfortunately, we don't have KLP um, support. So. Uh, as far as generating those sections, I think um, kpatch build might be the only tool that creates them today. Um, so uh, the next few slides were just a, a kind of a quick review uh, and, and samples of um, what are some of the special sections that you may find in the kernel and, and sort of why are they interesting to us and why do we need to do special relocations for them. Um, so I said about going through the kernel and had to basically learn what all of these special sections you know, mean and do. Um, uh, the, the simplest um, example is the SMP locks. And you know, if you had a piece of code that looks like that, this is what your um, assembly output would look like. And then in a special separate section, um, you would have these relocations to um, the code, in which case they may act differently depending on the SMP environment. Um, that said, this is a really boring example for KLP convert because we don't need to do anything special. It's all, everything's local to the module, um, but it seemed like the, uh, the easiest introduction. Things get a little more interesting when you want to handle uh, alt instructions. So alternatives are um, just a means of keying off of um, a CPU feature and you either call one, one set of uh, assembly instructions or the second set. So in this example, I'm just uh, showing you that the, uh, so for that piece of code, um, you get an alt instructions um, section, which includes uh, an array of um, structures that, that have relocations to the, uh, the old or, or the, the first alternative um, code location, which would be located, I guess, in, in text. Um, and then you also have um, the alternative instruction, and that's located in the alt inst replacement um, section. So we initially, uh, so when you look at this, there is nothing special that KLP convert necessarily needs to do um, to the, the alt instruction section. However, if the, the text and the alt instruction replacement code, if they themselves had relocations, then you would need to do something special. So this is sort of where um, the arch-specific um, nature of the, the um, KLP um, um, relocations arose. And uh, so th this was the uh, sort of... Um, problem that, that we had a couple years ago where uh, there was an order of operations in problem. When you load a module, we would try to uh, apply the alternatives first, and then much later, um, we would resolve the live patch relocations. Um, right. So um, the correct order was that we needed to load the live patch uh, apply our special funky relocations first, uh, and then handle um, any alternatives and uh, paravert patches. So um, this is sort of the um, the beginning of the complications of you know 
um, things that my patch needs to do to, to handle all of these, these sections. Um, so right now, k, uh, k patch build generates um, the right uh, KLP arch um, relocation sections, but KLP convert does not. And, and some of that was um, simply because uh, we didn't know where the, the late module patching discussion was going to go or if there'd be big changes to you know, how and when we load it live patches. Um, so a more complicated example is our, our jump tables. We were talking about this earlier. Um, jump tables allow you to sort of dynamically patch and, and choose which, which code uh, you're, you're executing. Um, these are also uh, kind of complicated. The, um, y y when you use these, you end up with uh, an entry in the modules jump table, in which you have two relocations to the sort of default path and I think the, the, uh, the target path. Um, and those um, are, are going to be local to the module, not interesting. But what could be interesting is if the module key lived somewhere else. So uh, perhaps it's you know another uh, kernel module that's not loaded. Um, so this is yet another um, KLP convert to do. And in fact, it's a kpatch build to do. Um, today, we just try to detect um, their usage in kpatch build and then tell the user to do something else. You know, you apply a workaround. Um, so I, I think, uh, and as far as I understand handling the jump tables, I think we would need to do basically the same um, bookkeeping that we currently do for all instructions. And, and that is, if we find um, one of these, uh, these relocations that need to be resolved externally, then um, we would need to take the uh, take the entry out of the jump table, put it aside in an arch specific um, section, uh, and then handle it uh, you know, according to uh, you know, this order of operations. Easy peasy, right? Um, so more to do. Um, how many other of these architecture specific uh, sections do we need to worry about? Um, I had only started looking at the x86 ones. Uh, I think jump tables were probably the most complicated one. So they seem reasonable, but at the same time, it's kind of annoying to have to uh, essentially you know, learn all the other code patching and special section um, mechanisms and then potentially um, I don't know, modify them to, to operate dynamically. You know, in, in the case of jump tables, I think uh, the code assumes that you know you're loading a kernel module and everything is there for it. Um, for us to to do this trick, uh, that code is going to need to handle the idea of you know uh, sort of inert, you know, not ready um, jump jump labels, and then later we're going to have to tell it, yeah, this one's ready to go. You can you know consider it live. Um, so in that regard, uh, I think. If we're going to support them, I think we need really good tests to make sure that uh, when those other kernel features change, that you know, we're ensuring that that uh, KLP convert and live patch is handling handling them uh, appropriately. Um, I've written a few of these tests, um, and uh, and then when I was developing KLP convert, um, so I have jump table mo modules with jump tables that try to do like a little bit of everything. Um, so uh, things like that where you know you have jump tables that are defined in another module and it's not loaded or maybe it is loaded or it gets unloaded. All of these things we're going to have to write, uh, I think we're going to have to write tests for just to make sure that when the kernel moves that you know we're not missing something. It sounds like, would this be solved from what we were talking about earlier? Yeah. Not, uh, mm. well. almost, but not everything, because this is only, this should solve the non-exported symbols as well, so if, and they could live in VM Linux as well, so if 
if you try to reference non-exported symbol, it should be solved by this. We yeah. could do it differently and weaken the restriction in kernel module order, but I don't. I have well, to think I mean, about what's it. the issue? Well, you're talking about the jump labels again. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know I that's an right. example which could be solved. Yeah. yeah. Okay. By a proposal and or I okay. mean. Yeah, so yeah, most of these complications would go away. If and this is why I keep saying it's so, like everyone's like kind of reluctant from doing this, but I think your idea is excellent. If we have like, a cape, like you, with a, I'll tell everyone so it's kind of recorded. Uh, what I was talking about offline uh, with Peter here was the fact that if we had, okay, all your, you break it up per module or object as your terms, and you know, you load the K module, you have a directory in slash lib slash module slash u name dash r slash light patch where you load all your modules that you're going to patch in, or every module that needs to be patched has its own K patch. Your tool, when you're going, okay, up or add the live patch, will you know, load the kernel one, then it'll go through and look at all the modules that are loaded and find in this directory which ones that need to be loaded so it's only loaded there. Then you modify insert mod or whatever, have a user space helper that when you do insert a module, it will check this path that's defined and everything's signed so you make sure you're getting everything correctly. And you can even put version, like info, module info information in there so it even has version numbers and everything else. You go and say, oh, this module has a live patch to it. Let's do it together on module load. Solves all these issues. And then if you, the question about upgrading, you say, okay, now we want to upgrade. You, go and you do your, you do everything, you would actually record what you have in the directory, blow it away, load all your new stuff in, go do all the updates again, just like you did where you remove the old one, atomically remove it and re-add it. And I think all these issues go away with that. I, 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 I'm all for, you know, big changes to make this simpler, <laughs> as long as they are consistent, right? Then so you know, don't preclude maybe yeah. existing things that we support. So I think that it actually might work. It, it might be a bit tricky because, for example, when we are uh, loading some to be patched module later, then we might need to like load the module, then but don't ca call it in its in its script. Then we need to load the live patch module related live patch module so that it handles its uh, relocations alternatives and all this stuff and even uh, that it actually enables the f trace and and stuff like this to actually do the redirection to the new code and then when it's like transitioned and this is done then we then we need to call the init script of the to be patched module so that the fixed code is used yeah. like but uh, but it's doable just that module code is quite tricky but it's it's doable I, I guess so if if we split it up so that each basically each patch module is specific to an object right or specific yeah. to a module yeah I mean yeah, yeah. Would, that, we, would that break the consistency model between um, modules in the kernel itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or? I guess that we will need some more support from module loader, like that we uh, load a new version of the live patch that it will need to first load all the modules yeah. for each module that is already live patched. So we can and maybe coordinate it. Once this done and ready, then it will need to start transition of all this module, so it we could not do it by the in it callback from the module, but it will need to be triggered from the module loader. But still, I think that it's something like doable, yeah. And it would remove. Well, we still will need like our own code to actually create these uh, sections, but we will actually create the like the normal relocation sections, alternative sections. Not the uh, arch ones. No, not, not the KLP specific yeah. ones, and we would need to keep them around and, and stuff like well, that. Well, that, that depends, because you either have a, have a separate special section with special relocations, or you leave those as normal ones, or ordinary ones, but then you need to, then you need to change the module loader not to warn or error out on them. So that's 
No, actually, not because we need to load the module first, like the do to be patch. So the symbols will be there. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, I know, but you still um, there's that non-ambiguous issue with static symbols, so that you could have more symbols of the same name. So you need to still have a name, how to differentiate between them. So, yeah, but not in so the same module. Yeah, but actually, we already oh, you, do we, this. Or you could. You could. Of yeah. course, you could. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Oh, yeah, sure. But it's already done. Uh, we. Uh, it's. Yeah, yeah. but. So wouldn't the, the, the other KLP re relocations, the normal ones, take care of that case? But it's already solved. We, ha yes. we have the same troubles when we generate our own like KLP-specific section. We already have to resolve this duplicity when creating this entry. Oh, yes, sure. So, so what, yeah. what I'm saying is that you still have to yeah. have those uh, special sections. So yeah, that's yeah, not, yeah. Like not, not special sections, away. like... We need to be able to create these sections, but actually we will create like normal sections that will be handled by the module loader. No. So, no. You, need, so you need extra section, but not extra code that will be handling it as a, as a special section. Like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Like, we, we need to create these sections by our own code, by some post module, uh, post build. Something. Yeah, but they will not be special from the point of view of the actual linker. Um, I, th I think they should be or must be handled separately because what Miroslav was mentioning is these um, multiple symbols of the same name in these actually do happen. And what we're, what the, what these um, KLP um, relocation section provide is that you can specify an index, which oh, see. watch uh, symbol oh, okay. of these oh, see. Okay. Uh, several duplicates you want. Okay. And for that, you yeah. probably need special code. I mean, you can merge it mm. yeah. into the module lot. I don't know, yes. but. <laughs> so that, oh. I was just gonna say that, yeah, I think for relocation, for relocation, check. <laughs> okay, um, for relocations, I, th I think you still need the special stuff, but it, maybe for everything else you wouldn't, yeah. for all the alternatives. And the yeah, you wouldn't be creating uh, another jump table or special section thing just for this purpose. You might still have KLP relocations, however, um, and those could be yeah. resolved ordinar ordinarily, yeah. Okay, um, so finishing it up, uh, on the lighter side of things, yeah, other to-dos, um, external modules, currently the, the patch set really doesn't consider those right now. Um, I, I think we can probably, if somebody really needed that or that was a requirement, um, we, would, we would just have to um, somehow augment the symbol list database. I don't know, provide two symbols files or something like that. Um, I don't know if anybody is really screaming for that, so. I think in the, at least the initial version, uh, I didn't really consider it a showstopper. Um, the other strange bug uh, that we encountered while developing the patch set was um, a BFD library um, bug, where if you try to run something like OBJ dump or GDB on the generated um, kernel object files, um, they link against this uh, binary format, I guess, you know, library, it doesn't or did it didn't like um, the fact that we were creating a second uh, a second relocation section to the same section. It, it was built with the assumption that you'd only have one you know dot rela dot text that you wouldn't have like a you know a dot dot rela dot klp dot text. Um, so right now, um, I think there's a um, it's a kind of a mit mitigation was recently checked in to um, kind of disable that assertion. So uh, at least with the, the latest version of those, of, of bin noodles anyway, and, and um, uh, it, it will at least continue processing the binary. It may not make complete sense of um, our KLP sections just yet, but again, you, know, you could use it to maybe disassemble or, or whatever else you use those tools for. 
Um, so that's it. Um, the patch set, so version four, version five, kind of in development. Uh, probably p post that soon. Is there any other questions? Okay. No? Yes? Sure, maybe. <laughs> it's a trivial one. Mm -hmm. Why call it KLP convert? Kernel, live patch, relocation, conversion. I think it's a question for Josh. He wrote it. Yeah. It's been a few years. <laughs> yes, it's been a few years. It's been a f it's been a few years since I wrote it, but um, I think I was thinking that you convert normal relocations into our special KLP relocations. That was the original intent, and then the scope may or may not grow depending on this late module patching issue. Hi again. So uh, this talk is going to be more about uh, how well are we testing live patching infrastructure as such, or it's more about what is available as far as I know, and I know the, uh, the presentation is more about how much more can we do kind of a thing. So yeah, previously you handled two columns, now it's going to be three. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the way it goes is like, uh, on the uh, leftmost thing is, uh, uh, when we say live patch test as such is like before 2019, I mean beginning of this year, mostly it would mean is like uh, we can load the example modules and everything passes, then that's fine as of now. But beginning of this year, we merged in the self test, so that would mean that running a self test and a self test and everything is fine. Then we can say that you know safely. Uh, I I call it this. I mean like till this right the green color one, the light green, I call it as 50% safe, I'm like, yes, we are ready to go kind of thing. Uh, that's how I generally term it. And uh, I'm sure that most of us have our own unit test cases which are lying down in our own laptops, which we use to test the features or uh, test the features and which are not upstream as of now. Uh, I know for sure that, you know, Kpatch has its own set of test cases, which is used to test kpatch as such, but the modules you generate out of it can be tested to, uh, can be used to test the kernel infrastructure, I mean, light patching whole infrastructure as of now. And yes, uh, what we do is like, anyways, we do build light patches for all the CEVs and security fixes. That also exercises how well is the kernel infrastructure as such. So. So I, I, I call that as like 100%, like if, uh, if it passes both this condition, and it does, mostly it's like, so yeah. So then it's like 100% pass kind of a thing. So this is what I'm aware that we currently have, and this is how we are testing live patching infrastructure as such. Uh, I'll come to the ra random thing later, and if you're going to see uh, the combinations which I'm aware of what people test is like the distro kernel, uh, distro tool chain, upstream kernel, distro tool chain, and we have upstream kernel and upstream tool chain. These are the combinations I've seen people testing live patch with. And um, so, so again, the same combinations, right? If everything goes well with distro kernel and distro tool chain, then yeah, that's fine. But upstream kernel and distro tool chain, everything is fine then. I call it like, it's like 100% safe kind of thing. But uh, I don't know how many of us really do this. I put it in the red bar where you have the upstream current GCC build and current upstream kernel build it. Try building live patching for that with w the test cases which we have. So uh, that kind of testing is also done. So this is what I'm currently aware of. And it was glad to see that uh, this time around we had a lot of discussions when we having 
hallway discussions even, even today all through the talks that like we need to improve the self test coverage so that would be something which would be nice to have so i guess we should be pushing more self test cases and uh, i'll come to the automation part later later uh, one feedback which i got from the test teams back at uh, ibm is like oh it's all nice that you guys have you do a good job of testing but we don't okay so they were like do you have automated way of doing it is that uh, anything like ltp or any of those very uh, prominently used upstream projects which i can just download and does it runs part of it that's one question they had and uh, another question they had was like uh, we do a lot of random things with a lot of things like uh, uh, one good example even which joe mentioned was like uh, load and unload modules like 100 times or 200 times continuously right those kinds of things or you just echo, enable disable the uh, a particular module which we have live patch for even the example module if you're going to do 100 times if you're going to do it or do those kinds of things right we don't have test cases of those sorts which are available in the test suits which have been prominently run by a lot of people so that's something where we lack coverage on the failure test case or we don't have test cases which really hammer sort out of things or uh, things which people should not do those kinds of test cases are something which are really missing and uh, another uh, thing which i wanted to say is like i guess it's high time it's time that we start enabling live patch as default config in upstream kernel is, is that a nice idea i'm like so that because distribution have it now the distribution have it but that, that's that's not really the criteria usually for upstream feature to be enabled. Usually most of the features that are not needed should be default to disabled. Yes, I, I'm just asking, should be. I mean, the reason why I ask this is like, if it's enabled by default, then there are a lot of automation tests, I mean, like build tests which has been run by a lot many people. That would mean that uh, if that is enabled and self test is enabled, if you can, that means that they're going to capture anything which breaks. I, I. I think it should stay as it is right now. So it should be disabled by default be, and not always say that, as Eco said, only those features which are required should be enabled. But with all those changes with GCC and that F live patching option I talked about, I think it should be disabled by default. Okay. I mean, if, <coughs> if the concern is that, <coughs> sorry, things like kernel CI or whoever is zero day but they they do their own configurations anyway either they run run config which enables live patch okay. or they actually have their own configuration which is what i think the current ci people they just enable everything for for the testing sure. uh, i'm not sure possibly we want to cross check with them or yeah yeah sure that's a that's a good that's point that's something we need them to start running with live patch enables that, that that's a good point definitely thanks yeah. yeah and i actually i think that there is even some file that describes what configuration options are needed for the given tests in the self-test uh, yeah. framework. So uh, actually, so I guess that if someone wants to run this test, then they would likely enable this configure options. Uh, okay, uh, the concise yeah. which I'm trying to get is like, uh, I don't know if we do it, but the whole point is like, how do we get a lot many people to test it indirectly? That's the question. We ourselves do, we do a lot of testing for ourselves. That's for sure. That's what I listed out saying. These are the things we generally do now. But how do we make sure that others also do it? So that's something which is what the whole thing is all about, right? The idea is like, we are doing it. How do we help others or what is those things you can do so that it gets more coverage? And yeah. I think that's a good question. Um, if we rewind uh, maybe a couple months, um, when the stack unwinding or stack trace code broke live patch, um, even though we had the tests in place, I thought um, it wasn't until Miroslav mentioned it on the mailing list that I know that it actually broke. Um, and I did query the, the zero day guys, and uh, I ran out of ways to re rephrase my question. I didn't. I didn't feel like I really got a, an answer out of um, exactly when do they run the tests with our configuration. Um, that seemed ambiguous. Um, so, I don't know, to Kamalesh's point, you know, if 
the more people that test it, the better. And whatever we can do to make that happen, you know, um, that's reasonable. It would be a good idea. Uh, one thing we definitely need is the failure test cases. Like things should fail. I mean, like if uh, things like as if now we have is like this is how it's supposed to work. It works, and this is how it's supposed to fail. We don't have that criteria. Well, the, there are a few cases which I think do fail to say load a module. I think um, I don't recall off the top of my head, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean we don't we don't stress the machine or do you know insane things that a customer might try. <laughs> and we do we do try to catch a lot of uh, failures at build time. But we can catch build also. Uh, having said that, okay, that that reminds me of another thing is like uh, there are a lot of other utilities which captures information when something goes wrong, like SOS report or support config. I guess we should go back and even check whether they're capturing information about uh, things which are related to LiveCatch. Uh, I'm not sure. I've I've not cross checked. It just like strikes my right now that anything which enterprise guys would might be capturing information about the current state of the machine. Possibly we want to look at that those also. Because, because, yeah, that's something which possibly we want to look into also, actually. So, and uh, uh, the craziest of the idea which someone suggested was like uh, testing random kernel patches, try to build it, and see if it breaks or not. I, I'm sure that it's like at least seventy percent of the patches are going to be not buildable at all. And whichever builds, you just try inserting it. I don't know. It's it's just like ideas which just like came when we were discussing like how can we break live patching infrastructure and these were yeah. the suggestions they came up with. It's like why don't we do it? So the reason why they said it is doable was uh, the middle one. We have something implementation the snow patch implementation. What it does as if now is like it listens to the PowerPC mailing list. So every patch which comes in, it would just redirect to an internal Jenkins thing which would just do a kernel bit. So uh, the suggestion was like, we'll just add one more step to it. We'll just uh, uh, and we'll just create a live patch there. I mean, just try to insert it. So uh, that's something which is like a little crazier. And I was like, yeah, we can do that. But I'm sure 70 to 80 percent of the patches would not build. We're like, that's fine. Whichever builds, let's try inserting it. I mean, so it's it's like one crazy idea which guys back on like, like let's do kind of these kinds of things. So this is yeah. Um I've considered similar things in the past. Um, one problem with that is that just because it builds doesn't mean it's going to run. So it could it could crash, and exactly. we don't know if it crashes because it's supposed to crash or because yeah. it's a real bug. Right? So, yeah. uh, okay. So, uh, so the, uh, what we can always do is like uh, the guys have gone to the level where they can filter the functions, and if had, it has something to do with functions which are like. From the live patch directory as such, or the functions which we care about. I mean, it's, these are just like the general idea which mm -hmm. came up with. I'm, I'm sure we can refine it. Uh, I think it would be really helpful for K patch build if we had a way to somehow do that or just try to patch every single um, function in the kernel and see, you know, see what breaks. Because um, yeah, okay. so yep. I, I guess I'm like the whole idea which I'm trying to say is like, how do we go about it? Um, perhaps um, for test cases, simply something like identity patching would make sense, so that you try to replace a kernel with itself, because you are, know it's going to work or it's supposed to work, okay. and you're testing the live patching infrastructure. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so I, I just put across the ideas I had. So the whole thing was like, so what other things can we do, or should we start discussing more on? How do we start? So I, I had um, something um, earlier today. Uh, I went to the K self test talk, um, and um, they brought up um, an idea that I guess I ha had not considered when I created the self tests, and that was that uh, they were thinking of recommending that people grab the latest, greatest K self tests and run those against older, stable kernels. And when I heard her say that, I remember thinking, like, oh, my God, um, 
every time I look at the test, I always think of it as a snapshot of, you know, it's in the tree, it's testing that tree, that version. And it, it kind of, you know, um, made me wonder if we need it, if we need a, a, an easier way from the testing perspective of uh, figuring out what live patching features or feature versions, I guess, like um, currently exist. Um, you know, we do we maybe export a sysfs file that says, you know, has uh, has shadow variables or has callbacks or atomic replace. Um, maybe this is all in one file, you know, some way to get at it from, from user space without having to parse um, kernel, uh, kernel revision strings. Uh, I know from the, from the kpatch build experience, when you start parsing uh, the, 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 the version strings, you have to put in all of these exceptions for the distributions, right? Because they start backporting stuff and it's just kind of annoying. So do you, do you know how the others use it? in the soft tests. I, I mean, because we are not the only one with features. I'd have to go look, I, I don't know. Um, other people had, had stated that they have ways of, of re reporting the, the features. Um, and uh, it, it, the, the initial, I think this is a couple, in a couple uh, weeks or months ago, um, had a similar issue where I wanted to disable the tests for architectures that we don't support. And uh, I think I just wanted to key off the configuration variable. Because I'm a developer, I'm lazy. I run the test from inside my kernel tree. The uh, kernel configuration isn't present. So the problem would be, I guess, if somebody installs the test separately and they don't have the config, you know, how do you get there from here? It's kind of an annoying thing, right? You're building this user space thing out of the kernel tree. So uh, I think this is something general so maybe there you should, must be we should ask sure about it how to do it properly and right well in, in, in I guess two pieces right there's the kernel side which I would think um, you know subsystems get to I guess define how they do it and and if there's a standard that makes sense a key value store or something um, you know you could just write a grep utility to, to figure that out so hmm. uh, the self-test at the same time could have a little library to uh, to help us out with that The last thing which I heard was like, I guess uh, something like Travis CI for the patches which we are trying to do, at least for the live patch directly, something which possibly we want. If that would be nice to have. If for all the patches which you are trying to put, at least like figure out, weed out a lot of things which other combinations which we have, because Travis now is like good enough, and if it is possible, then we should try doing it. This covers what I had. If is there something else which so uh, one thing uh, are we going to push the test cases from our laptops to self test? We should. And another thing would be is like conclusion is the SOS report and the support config we want to figure out. So, yep, that's what I had. My discussion is more about uh, the distribution point of view, and is uh, how uh, we can involve the user to do live patching, and about <coughs> open source in live patching service that we have. So, recap last year, we had a suggestion about LTS live patch repository. We have <coughs> a talk about this every but uh, uh, we got. Uh, Disable GCC optimization, and <coughs> I talk about uh, LF patch. 
so uh, updating from uh, LF patch, we move everything to Docker, and it's more simple to use, and we updated the documentation. We tried to use Travis CI, but it have, uh, I don't know if, uh, by using a uh, kpatch build, it takes too much time, and we go in timeout every time. So we will probably try to move to different infrastructure. <coughs> the current infrastructure, we have uh, a Docker container that have uh, the kpatch build, and we have a host, but in the future we want to use a different Docker container for uh, reproduce the environment in better. So uh, the discussion topics are uh, what is the next step from an open source distribution point of view uh, that maybe doesn't have a resource to write each live patch? And uh, are these even useful for open source uh, live patch uh, distribution? and how we can make more people involved in writing life patch. And I think uh, Joe's idea about uh, writing more documentation is one good point about this. <coughs> That's everything. <laughs> so if there is any question, or we can close. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so as w to, to the point of sharing uh, live patch sources, just, just a remark that Miroslav was showing to some, somebody during the break, that actually we as SUSE actually do publish all the live patches we are distributing okay. uh, and generating and distributing to our customers. So they are publicly available in a git tree on kernel.suze.com. Okay. I think also Ubuntu is doing such things. Maybe, I don't know. Well, yeah. Not anymore. Okay. You are know, working on changing that. And I. Uh, I, I didn't need that, but. Sorry. I didn't mean And I think, li like, uh, also about other live patch services, I see, I heard yesterday from Joe about, uh, about kernel care. Yeah, yeah, maybe just to the um, sharing live patch resources, that it also depends on the other patches that are uh, applied on the kernel yes. that we are trying to uh, live patch because distributions usually have a lot of thousands of patches on top of upstream. So yes. these are called Frankenstein kernels. So the live patch uh, from this kernel probably wouldn't be good or will, will play nice with other kernels that don't have the other patches. Yeah, I would like to add that even if you focus on like stable some version yes. of stable, um, and ha have actually do have source-based live patches. Um, I don't know in which from the KVH build live patches come, probably as a diff or something. Um, but for source-based live patches, it's the result pretty much depends on the configuration and architecture and everything, so it's different, yes. pr probably. <coughs> but will be anyway useful as documentation? Uh, as, uh, can you repeat that question? Uh, if they can be anyway useful for documentation, like a sample on how to make patch, or the user can use as a sample. <coughs> because I think the point is having a community around there. So if you have people that are helping. I, I don't know, but it's a yeah. Anyway, I, I think that maybe the best approach will be like to automate the stuff and I guess that the work is in progress like that 
KLP GCC and KLP converter are the pieces, big pieces that would help to actually automate this. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're talking about like documenting it for like users, Gen 2 users, mm -hmm. desktop users, so I think there's no way because um, yeah, you have to inspect the, the the patch basically if it's suitable for live patching or not. So I think that could become a problem. So if you want to document it for for like <laughs> a certain <laughs> class of people, <laughs> like live patching authors, so I mean that. That's pretty much been what uh, Joe's talk had been about, so I think. Okay, thank you.